Well, hello guys. Welcome back to the Beastie Room. Now, we did have in our previous video last week, where we done the rehousing of the seven different spiders, we asked you at the end of the video, and I hope, I actually hope that that was very helpful for most of you. Uh, we certainly enjoyed doing it. And one of the things we asked at the end was we were going to do a question and answers video. So we asked you all to put in some questions of some of the things that you would like to know. Now, whether that be about the spider room or about us or whatever. So, without further ado, let's get on with it, camera lady. Hello, yeah, we've got the questions here. So I'll just start from the top, Dave, and we'll work down and let you see what you've got to say. So Be kind to me. <laughs> this is just our subscribers here. So... Danny Mac's children and the winter melon that has good abilities would like to know as all spiders are pretty and gorgeous which do you think are the most pretty and gorgeous and what are your favorites oh that's a really tough question actually because there is so much variety within the spiders that we keep it's very difficult I, I tend to see things in all of them and different things in different spiders. I suppose if we're looking at um, outwardly really quite striking spiders, I still think the uh, Samopaeus aminia, the Venezuelan sun tiger, that's a real, that's a catchy spider, that is. That's very, very pretty. But then we also look at the other spectrum. Um, some of the pokies, some of them are really nice. It's very, very difficult. As for favourite spiders, um, I don't really have a favourite as such. Because, they are, again, I like them all for different things. You quite often say about the cayenne kraken, Dave. What's it specifically about that one? That... Yes, we have, I have got a soft spot for the cayenne kraken. And that's because, um, one, she's very, very impressive. And it's a funny thing, actually, she's actually jet black. So she's just black all over. Um, so she's not got anything in terms of, like, wonderful colours and things. But she is a very, very impressive spider. And um, she's been a nice one to work with because she's also, um, she's they're a feisty spider. So they've got a bit about them. But we've learned over the years to how to handle them without getting that nasty side of them you know that that really sort of um defensive side so they're a um yeah they're a very they're a special spider and it's also one of the ones that i still haven't managed to do a successful breeding from so there's a bit of a a commitment there between the two of us we're um yeah we're still we're still fighting that one yeah well, so next, Nick Sweeney asks, have you ever cared for any Sydney funnel web or Brazilian wandering spiders? Ooh, yeah. No, well, that's a good question, Nick. Um, I think in the, the Sydney funnel web, I have never had the pleasure of uh, working with those, but that is a spider that I really would like to work with, purely because I'd like to see the differences between that and our Japanese funnel webs that we keep here and some of the other funnel webs that we've had in the past different ones um i would really like to compare them uh because i i do think that they they're very very similar so i don't i don't see any differences but yeah they would be really cool um as for the brazilian wandering spider i have had them in before in the past many years ago um and worked with them and again one of the things with these types of spiders that people really get sort of turned on by is the fact that they are classed as a deadly spider. Um, and generally speaking, all of your, your top venomous spiders, things that are on the DWA list, which is the dangerous wild animals list, anything that's on that list gets an awful lot of um, recognition. People really want to, that's what they aim for. It's a bit like DWA scorpions, but the thing, the real key is they are no different from any other spider that you may have in your collection. It's just because their venom is particularly toxic. But if you handle them all the same, and this is one of the things we tell everyone, that if you handle even your, your um, most least 
venomous spider. Handle it just the same as you would a really, really venomous spider. You won't go wrong. Everything's exactly the same. Thank you. Michelle Burrich would like to know if the Exoterra Mini she has housed her Avic Avic in is adequate. There is ventilation across the bottom and the top, but she's a little worried this may not be enough cross ventilation for her. Right, this is um, this is a question that's that's actually it's a really big question if you like, um, and that breaks into the ground of cross ventilation in enclosures, and it's something that I think we need to um, address maybe in a separate video. Um, but to answer your question. I keep all of my AVIX in um, Exoterra um, enclosures, and I keep them all in 20 by 20 by 30 enclosures. I do have the mesh roof on them, and I find that there is more than adequate ventilation for them spiders. They, they, your spider will be perfectly happy in that enclosure. Don't get too hung up on the cross ventilation. Um, we, will, we will do a video covering that particular subject because it's a very broad subject okay apologies if i don't get any of the names right i'll do my best with them uh this is from i see give for you did you make your table or modify it yourself i see it has the ridges that give spiders a place to hide without disappearing or flying off onto the floor have you ever had a camel spider is also Oh, two questions there. Um, right, now the table, I did actually uh, build myself. Um, so it's built to, to, to fit into the room and to, to suit everything I actually need. The top piece with the extra lip on it, I actually stole that idea from uh, Mr. Grindler's Creatures, Jaden. He had, um, I saw his table and I was like, Wow, all these years, and I've never actually, uh, never actually thought about that. But what a brilliant idea! So yes, I stole that from Jaden, um, and it works really, really well. So yeah, I can't, I can't claim to have had that mar that idea myself. It is a stolen idea, and um, and I'm very grateful. It's worked really, really well. Um, if you haven't subscribed to his channel, pop over and have a look. Well worth a look. Really good channel. Um, as for the camel spiders, this is a spider that um, I have had in the past and I've managed to keep them alive for quite some time. But they are a spider that I would really, really like to um, do some real decent work with and try and breed them in captivity because they're a spider that is wild caught in big, big numbers. And this is primarily due to the fact that no one is breeding them. Now, I know there has been a few claims to people that have captive bred them, but there doesn't always appear to be the information to back it up. So whether they are wild caught and they've been real lucky enough that they've dropped a sack um, and it's come about like that, that is probably what I do believe is what's happening. Um, I've not read or seen any articles that outline an actual captive breeding. So yes, that is a spider that I would like to get involved with in the future. Um, but I just need to be able to source 20 or 30 of them to produce an absolute a viable um, project. But I don't want to pay the prices individually for them because it would be far too expensive a project. So I'm looking for something where I can um, perhaps get 20 or 30 um, at cost. <laughs> so if there's any dealers out there and you're interested in doing a collab with the Beastie Room, I'd be more than happy to work with you. So yeah, good question. Brian Lindsay has noticed sometimes the spider will move towards the brush and sometimes it will move away. Is there really any way to predict what the spider may do? Yes, we. Um, you'll often hear me say that your spider is talking to you all the time. And by this, I mean... If you watch its behavior and its body language, it actually moves in different ways to give you an idea of what's gonna happen. Now, looking at the behavior in animals is something that's fascinated me for years. So it's something that I really look deeply into and I perhaps 
um, see things that maybe not everyone else sees. Um, and this is purely because it's something that I've done for many, many years. Um, so it becomes almost a second nature to me. So quite often it, when you watch me in videos and I'm doing things, it doesn't look like I'm paying too much attention, but I am fully aware of everything that's going on. And this is because I can often read the very, very small movements and things, and they give me an insight as to what is likely to happen next. It doesn't always work. Sometimes you think something's going to happen and it happens in a different way, but then we just fall back on our knowledge and we react in a certain way to, to deal with the situation in hand. So yeah, they're, they're, they are, they're chattering away all the time. You just got to read the signals. Well, that follows up with Susan Grew. Um, are there specific behaviours that you watch for to tell you if your spiders are healthy? Oh, good question, Susan. Yes. Well, there's many, many things that we can look at to decide whether we've got a healthy spider. And most of it is, in fact, a behavioural thing. So if we look at, um, if our spider's behaving correctly, then we can assume that everything is all right. So if your spider is doing everything that it should do, it's molting, it's feeding, you know, it's resting, it's out looking for food, these are all different things that it does. And to some people, they all look exactly the same. But as you build your knowledge, you will understand that they are very, very different things. Just the way your spider sits is a good indication of how healthy it might be. So, um, or unhealthy, depending if it's sat in a certain way. Um, sometimes we just get a spider that might look absolutely fine, and then 24 hours later is dead. Um, and we've got no reason to understand. We just don't understand why it might have happened. And in them cases, we can only look back and work out whether everything was correct beforehand. And by that, we can just look at the way things were and how that spider behaved. So yes, there's, there's many, many things that will give us an indication as to what is good or bad within our spider. <laughs> this is a good one, Dave. We've got Joanne Galway. She said... Did Camera Lady share your love of spiders from the start of your relationship? But she also wants to know, what's the rarest, most expensive tarantula in your grand collection? Ooh. Um, <laughs> oh, what should we ask first? Did Camera Lady like spiders? I don't think she ever disliked them. I don't think she liked them quite as much as she does now. Um... Yeah, it's one of them things. Me and Camera Lady have been together for a very, very long time. And um, poor Camera Lady has been um, subjected to many, many pets of all different types of sizes, shapes and colours and everything, really. I'd say more privileged. From, yeah. Privileged. From, yeah, so, so yes, she, she, she has joined me with all of these things and her interest has often been spurred by my interest so we've ended up, we've shared absolutely everything. So everything that's come in, we've, we've pretty much done together. So, um, yeah, it's been really, it's been a cool journey so far. And uh, I'm sure we've got many more things ahead of us to, um, to enjoy as well. But uh, this is just one chapter in the life of, uh, in our life, I, I should say. Yeah. So, yeah, we've, uh, yeah, we've enjoyed many, many things. So, yeah, I, I think she enjoys it secretly. She likes catching all the babies and stuff, as you would have seen in the videos. She's very keen on that. She also does, um, I've got to say it, she does all of the cleaning as well, really. So I tend to take spiders out of enclosures and put them in new enclosures, and I just dump all the old ones on the floor. And then, miraculously, they disappear from the beastie room. And I'm like, oh, what do I happen there? But I don't think about it too much. I move on to other things. And then within a day or so, they all appear again, shiny and bright. And I'm like, wow, we have spider fairies. <laughs> so it all works out really, really well. Um, now, what was the other question? The, uh, all the most expensive. Or rarest. Or the rarest. Um, I don't think, this is a difficult one, actually, because rarity is often something that is different in different countries. So... What we have here, like, like the Celadonia, we have Celadonia here in the Beastie Room. Um, in America, 
they do appear to be far more rarer and they're very much more expensive than what they are here. Um, so I think um, we've seen um, prices of $600 in America for a Celadonia, whereas I sold my slings here in the UK for £60 each. So um, there's, it's all depending on where you are and, what, and where you go to. Um, and as for rarest, I mean, I'm, I don't know. Again, probably our funnel webs for us because um, they are quite difficult to come by and trying to actually sort out enough to do a project with is quite difficult. Whereas you go to other countries and they're, they're more accessible. So I would say maybe the, um, the Celadonia is probably globally one of the most expensive and, um, and our funnel webs are probably our rarest. Most of everything else we got is reasonably readily available. So Kim T, a little bit of a twist on the, the favourite. You always say that each spider is so beautiful and they really are. Do you have a species that you find not so beautiful? Ooh. Ooh, I don't know. Um... Right, okay. This is probably going to offend a few of you. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't say I don't, I don't find, I wouldn't say that I don't find them beautiful. I do. I think they're very pretty and, um, and I do like the look of them. I have no idea what's coming. This is a new one for me. Yeah, I do like the look of them, but let's just say they don't spark my interest. Dare I say, I find them a little boring. Uh oh. And that is the jumping spiders. <laughs> oh my God, there's going to be screams and uproars at this point. Because <laughs> yes, we all think we... they're so amazing and cute. Oh, I don't... Dave. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not a lover of jumping spiders. Um, <laughs> and I have mentioned this in the past. Oh, God. So, yes, probably my least favourite is maybe a jumping spider. It's okay. okay Sorry, guys. guys. We can hear you screaming right now. It's fine. They are the cutest things ever. Camera ladies, the 50 of a side of that. <laughs> no, no. Okay, we'll move on real quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Move on, move on. Do you have a favourite beast? I've just lost my first tarantula, a five-year-old pink salmon. Salmon pink, apologies. What do you do with the ones that you lose? All oh, right, so what we tend to do is um, if they are in good condition, um, so there's, there's no damage to them or anything like that, you know, they are in perfect condition, I tend to put them in the freezer. Um, and then I just save them up. Originally, I started doing this because I had um, ideas of getting them set. And there's a number of companies around at the moment that do some absolutely fantastic work where they, uh, they taxidermy your spider and they can set them up in... Beautiful things, um, whether they put them in domes or in picture cases, um, so that you can hang them on the wall, things like that. So I, that's how I originally started. That's why I put them in the freezer originally. And I never really got round to getting any of them mounted. Um, and this is um, purely because when I think about it, I haven't really got anywhere that I can put them. Um, I still do have an inkling. I would like, um, I'd like maybe a nice big tree trunk in the living room. Big thing, you know, six foot tree trunk with spiders and things all over it. I think that would look rather cool, you know, but I haven't got room in the living room for a big tree trunk. At so, the moment. So, um, yeah, so it's, so I tend to keep all mine. And then um, I recently gave a load to uh, a young guy by the name of Josh on, um, he was on Facebook. He was on um, Scott's Inverts on one of his live feeds, uh, live uh, things. And um, he, he's actually practicing now and learning the art of taxidermy and doing these different bits and pieces. So to help him out, I, I did donate some to him. And uh, hopefully we'll see them come up. That um, You know, he can set them up and sell them and do a really nice job. So, yeah, they, they, they get donated really to uh, the people who can. Um, if you can't donate them, what would you suggest could be done? Well, send them to one of these companies and uh, get them mounted yourself. Cool. Yeah. 
It's a good way of um, keeping your beloved spiders alive forever. Really cool. Hayley exclamation mark. What was your very first spider? Oh, that's easy. That was a Brac Bracopalma smithy, the Mexican red knee. And that was back in the days when they were Mexican red knees. They were all pure. And that's mainly because they were all wild caught. Now, um, it is one of those spiders that it, it's, um, what's the word? Um, the fact that it is so sought after is such a pretty spider. Um, and they're easy going as well. So they're a great beginner spider. It actually did help in its decline in the wild state. But we're talking back now of like 40 odd years ago. So um, when things were very, very different. And this is why there's been different legislation brought in around the world to stop the, the collection, the mass collection of certain species of animals, inverts and things like that. Um, and that is to protect them. Because unfortunately, back in the day, 40 odd years ago, there was no protection. And the, the true pure smithy almost got collected out of existence. And um, it's only because of um, the governments and the hobby in itself stepped in early enough and actually saved the spider from pretty much a, 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 um, a natural um, extinction, really. So that the only ones that we would have had would have been the ones in captivity. And then, as you've seen before, people get them mixed up with the homori. Um, so they, we would have struggled to have had purebred stock now. But the way things are now, they are now on the um, endangered list. They're on the CITES list. And uh, there's paperwork now to follow individual spiders around. So we know that they are purebred. And it's very important as breeders that we make sure that we only breed purebred stuff. So, yeah, that was my very first spider, the Smithy. Aww. Thanatos Soul Drinker, in one of my recent rehouses, I noticed the soil underneath my moss dried out to an incredible degree, despite me watering down the sides and occasional moss spraying. How do you prevent your moss covered soil from turning into bone dry clumps of dead earth? Where did I go wrong? Right, this is, um, this is something that's that happens um and it's, it's it's quite a full-on sort of um thing really basically what happens is if if you need to understand that your your moisture that you're getting from your enclosure is what feeds your moss so it's not Many people believe that if you just spray your moss or soak your moss on the top, then that is keeping your moss alive. Your moss is living through the roots that are below it, which you can't see, just like a plant does in a pot. So we need to feed the, the roots of your moss. So by having a bioactive enclosure where we can have the, the uh, clay balls in there and then we put our membrane down, then we put our soil down and then we put our moss on top of our soil. By keeping moisture within the clay balls underneath, the warmth in your room will create that moisture to warm up and want to escape your enclosure, which means it goes up through the different, or excuse me, through the different layers in your enclosure and then eventually feeding your moss. So it's not a case of your moss should be pretty much almost dry on top but your moisture coming up through is what's feeding your moss. That's what's keeping it alive and hydrated. So you can look at keeping that reservoir of water inside your clay balls, but we're not looking at keeping it soaking wet. So it's, it's a, if you're just looking at keeping the moss, then we're just keeping the soil damp, which is the dampness is coming from the moisture within your clay balls. It's, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult one to explain, but it is another thing that I think we can cover in a bigger subject in a bigger video, um, and we will, we will go into that because there's many reasons to keep um, water in, in the bottom of your enclosure 
to respect of no water in the bottom of your enclosure. So it all depends on what we're trying to achieve for the inhabitants as well. So it's it's a really it's it's a very broad question if you like. But yeah, generally your moss should be feeding from moisture from below. Okay, so I'm going to read out a couple of questions for you, Dave, because they're kind of similar around a, a certain subject. So okay. we've got Marie Louise Segalov. If you need to, can you hold them with your hands? Parrot feathers eyes. What's the worst bite and how many bites have you had? Kyra Gross. I can't imagine you getting bitten by any spider with your handling expertise, but has it ever happened? VT Streaming. Hello, how many beasties do you have and have you ever been bitten by any of them? And Skippy B Coyote, have you ever been bitten by a tarantula? Right, okay, let's get the bite one out of the way first. We've, uh, we often get asked, and I'll get, there's pretty much always a couple of questions on every video, have we ever been bitten? And the simple, quest, simple answer is no. I have never been bitten by a uh, spider, um, by anything that's, that we've kept. Never, never ever been bitten by anything that's kept. Um, I have been bitten by one of our UK spiders, and I'm not sure which one it was because I never actually saw it, but it bit me in the corner of, right in my finger there, um, and that was probably 25 years ago maybe something like that a long long time ago and I still suffer with soreness at where I was bitten so it's 25 years on and I still suffer with soreness from from that bite but I've never I've never actually been bitten by a captive spider of any kind um, and that is because we follow the golden rules so we always treat them as if they are absolutely deadly and uh, we treat them with the utmost respect and hopefully our videos show a little bit to as to how we've avoided and i mean i've been keeping spiders for 40 odd years and uh, i've never ever been bitten by one or even really come close to it so um yeah we are trying to share that with all you guys so hopefully none of you guys get bitten in terms of um if we look at it in numbers, if you look at the amount of people around the globe that keep spiders, and then you look at the amount of confirmed spider bites, there is very, very few. Very, very few. So uh, many people get really worried about being bitten by a spider. Spiders don't really want to bite you. You've got to push them a long way to get bitten. What was the other questions? Handling. Handling, right. I um, I personally don't um, promote handling of spiders, as in physically picking them up and playing with them. Um, I often, like in our previous video that we done last week, um, it was it was uh, labelled as handling spiders the beastie way, and by handling I mean moving them from one thing to another or physically trying to do something with that spider that is what i class as handling um when we look at um people when they say about handling spiders, they got them on their hands and they're moving around i class that as playing with spiders it's a different thing for me it's how i classify it so i don't play with spiders um i don't see any reason why you should need to hold a spider um it can be dangerous for you and it can be dangerous for them so it doesn't matter how calm you are. I'm, I'm, I'm calm around my spiders, but I tell you now, if I've got one on my hand and it decides to bite me, the first thing I'm going to do is go like that. You know, I don't want it on my hand anymore because it's just bitter me and it's going to hurt like hell. So, and also as well, I will get no indication of that coming. Chances are it's going to be bang. I'm not going to be quick enough to do anything about it. So it's going to bleed and well hurt. And, um, and I don't want to get bitten. So there's no need to hold one, is there, really? Um, as saying for that, each to their own. If someone else wants to go out and play with their spiders, 
It's not something that's ever interested me. Even when I got into the hobby many, many years ago, I was, I did hold one or two many, many years ago, but it's not something that's ever really interested me. And I don't really understand the reasoning behind it. Thank you, Dave. Oh, we've got a bit of a, a different one. It's Brandy has asked, are any of your spiders um, that you, you've, you've just rehoused in this video from Bethany? And if so, um, why have we got them from Bethany? Right, okay. Um, yes, we have got a few spiders um, from Bethany, from Bethany's spiders. Now, as many of you will know, um, she is basically decided to just take a break from social media. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with her. She's perfectly fine, perfectly fit and healthy. Um, she just decided to take a back seat. And this is one of the things that um, social media can um, dominate your life. And, and it does. And for anyone that puts, anyone who makes YouTube videos will know and understand the amount of work that goes into doing these videos. You've also then got all of the work from your collection. You still have to keep up with doing all of that. We all have full-time jobs as well. Um, then if you add in things like TikTok, Instagram, all the other social media platforms, it's an awful lot to try and keep up with. It's very, very difficult. And um, sometimes, you know, we need to just take a back seat. You know, we're only human and we, you know, we, it's Shall really, we? really difficult to keep on top of doing everything. Um, it's about enjoying your hobby as well, isn't it? Yeah, you need to, you need to be able to sit back. And I, and I tell you now, I mean, even with like what we do here, we do two videos a week. We also do Instagram um, to a lesser extent, but the two videos a week, and looking after the collection and doing everything else takes up every minute of my time. I work full time as well. Um, and it's very, very difficult to put it all into place and get everything working as one. If, if I stop enjoying my hobby, which is the most paramount part of it, then, you know, it, something has to give. And unfortunately, if it got to that point, it would probably be, making videos, you know, because it's, it's great to be able to share all this stuff, but you need to be able to enjoy it as well. It's very, very important. So yes, there's absolutely nothing, nothing wrong with Beth. And um, yes, we did have some spiders and that's purely because she downsized her collection to allow a bit more time for her to enjoy the parts of it that she really enjoyed. You know, it can, it can, you can become swamped in your spiders very very easily as many of you guys will know if you've only got a few spiders and then you go to a show you come back with another 10 slings we see it all the time on facebook you know i've been doing the hobby for six months and i've got 300 spiders it can get out of hand really really quick so um you know every now and again we need to downsize i do it myself you know once i've bred things quite often i'll move them on and i'll swap them for a species that i haven't done um, and this is because space is of an issue as much as anything. And we all suffer the same constraints. So, yeah, I hope, I hope that sort of yeah. answers that. <laughs> so, Johnny Neil 84 we've answered some of his question already, but would love to know when, how you got into keeping spiders, beasties, and what your first spider was. Also recall you saying you had a really impressive reptile collection at one time. Do you still keep reptiles in that way? And if not, what prompted the shift from reptiles to inverts? Right. Um, well, we answered that the, the first spider was the smithy, the Brachypelma smithy. We covered that. Um, in terms of um, my interest in spiders, now, I have, I have, I've been lucky. I've, I've been surrounded by animals, exotic animals, all of my life. And um, I've, I've been exposed to many, many things. And then also as part of my working career, I was a zookeeper for around about 11 years. And I've worked in conservation most of my life 
with other different places that I've been to as well. So it's um, it's something that's always been a part of me. Um, I was very much into tropical birds, and I used to keep an awful lot of birds um, back in the day. And as with most things, it's circumstances that change. As we go through life, circumstances change, and we have to adapt and change along with them. Now, with the reptiles, I've um, I was heavily into reptiles in a massive, massive way, and they still interest me today. Um, well, it's funny, actually, we had a conversation only today, me and Cameron maybe, and um, reptiles probably will make a, a comeback in my life at some point because there's still things that I feel I haven't done. So, you know, and this is one of the things. I do like a project, as you guys know, and um, I like a challenge, and there's still lots of challenges out there that we haven't achieved yet so yeah we're going to do them we but but it's time you know i mean circumstances changed i could no longer keep the reptiles the way i used to keep them so they had to go and um i i basically swapped them for spiders which i already kept as i kept my reptiles i kept spiders as well but spiders i can do a lot more with spiders in a small space than what i could with reptiles and uh, this is one of the issues we had was space. So um, hence the spiders took off. And I've, I've got much more heavily into spiders now than I've ever been into them. Um, so it's sort of uh, always been that, that way. So yeah, that's, that's how we've changed, changed direction. <laughs> okay, so we've got Janice Honey. My question is, do tarantulas have a heart? Ooh, wow. Do tarantulas have a heart? Um, actually, there's two ways of looking at this. Are we talking about um, actually as in a physiological way, um, do they have a heart? Or are we looking at it in terms of uh, do they have feelings? Um that's a bit of a yeah, a bit of a strange one. Um, as in terms of, of a heart, that's actually a really interesting question because there has been different in views as to how spiders physiologically work, um, what goes on, um, their internal organs, how things actually manipulate and work and what have you. And it's really quite confusing. And I've never been a hundred percent sure as to what I believe and what I don't believe, actually. That's a really curious question. Uh, in terms of um, in actual fact as to whether or not they um, have feelings, I don't think they have feelings as such, <laughs> but they do, they do react to their surroundings, and that is very important. We can, um, we can gauge our reactions by what we do, and, uh, and that can teach our spiders as well. They do this exactly the same thing. So, yeah. Um, in terms of a pumping heart, I don't think they actually have a pumping heart. I, it's a very I interesting question. It surprise me, actually, because, yeah, yeah it's, it's something I've never really thought about. Mm. It's, uh, we'll have to do a little thing, David, on anatomy of a spider. Yes. I think that could be a cool video. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So, um, Caro Knochik. Would uh, sorry, when do Tom Moran and you finally do a podcast together? Wow, yes. Um, we did speak on a live uh, of Scott's. Um, he done a he done a live with Tom Moran, and um, I was listening in. So we uh, we literally just had a little converse. Um, but yeah, that, that could be an interesting thing. I mean, I'm open to collabs with anybody, really. Um, I, don't, I don't mind. Um, it's only a question of time, as we, we were saying earlier on, on one of the other questions. We don't, we don't have a great deal of time. So it's difficult sometimes setting things up so that we can um, do them properly. Um, if we can't do it properly, then it's not worth doing at all. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something I'm open to. I'm, I'm always willing to uh, do something like that. He does some good stuff, and he's been around a long time. Um, and he's got he's got a really good following. You know, a lot of people really like 
and like his work. And um, yeah, I think we could have some very interesting conversations. Cool. FC 36, oh no, 360D. What are your thoughts on putting the smaller enclosure into the larger one and letting the tarantula walk out on its own? I think we've got a similar one like that, Dave, where Rene Turcoat Shiji Goat. I'm so sorry about these names, guys. I really am. She's not very good. No. Wouldn't it be have been easier um, to put the small container into a new larger enclosure then open the lid and let the spider walk out itself. So it's kind of the same feeling. Right, there. yeah. We get um, this, is, this is quite a popular question, actually, and, and comes up quite often in the comments. And the reason that I do things the way I do them is because, for me, physically moving a spider from one enclosure into another allows me time to observe that spider so that I can see and make sure that everything about it is fine, that it's in good health, it's moving correctly, um, and everything. It just gives me um, a chance to observe it there and then, so that I know that if that spider moves from one enclosure into its new enclosure and I didn't see any problems, if I then come to a problem later on, maybe within a few days, it might be within a few months, I know that that spider was perfectly healthy from the day that it went into that enclosure. So I can, you know, from that, I can um, look at it and know that it never went in there with a problem. So I now know that if it's got a problem, it's something that's been created while it's been in this enclosure, which means I can narrow down my thought process as to how I can identify what that problem may be. So, um, yeah, so I, I like to move them purely because I can give it a health check and basically just have a good glance over before um, before it goes. If we just put the enclosure inside the enclosure, I may never see it. You know, it could walk out missing two legs. I might not see them. So, um, yeah, it gives me an opportunity to give it a good, a good MOT, MOT. Darren Runyon. Did you learn to keep brush contact from watching the way the males move the females? Very, very good question. Yes. Now then, we've um, one of the things that we really, really like, or my personal thing that drives me all the time, is behaviour, animal behaviour and how we identify that behavior. And yes, you're right. When we look at the males, when we come to pairing our males, we can see that they do it in different ways. But it becomes very apparent when you watch the videos. The males, once the initial contact is made, the whole behavior changes. So we then know that while we're watching that, our male never loses contact until he's had enough and he wants to go. And then you see his behavior change again. So yeah. We watch them and then I've basically taken from that and I move our spiders. There's also a little bit of common sense in there as well. You know, if you sit there and think to yourself, you've got your paintbrush and you constantly poke your spider, it's going to get the ump. You know, if you keep tapping it like this, I see it all the time. People are they're like this, you know, that is not going to produce the results that you want from your spider. So a little bit of common sense, and yes, observation, that's the key. Brilliant. Good question. Yeah, really good. Greg Logan, do you milk your spiders for their venom? No, we don't, is the short answer to that. Um, there's very, very few spiders in the world that are milked. Uh, the most famous, obviously, being the Sydney funnel web, and that is because in Australia, they do have a problem with um, with spider bites from the Sydney funnel web spider. And it is the, the wandering males. Once they mature, they go out looking for a female. So it brings them in contact with people because they've now left their burrows and they're out looking for looking for females. And um, and I do believe, I think, you know, quite a few people that actually get bitten are often children and what have you because they're playing in their gardens and bits and pieces and they come in contact with these spiders. 
And because they've got a particularly nasty venom, a very strong, potent venom, then um, there is there has been work done and it's successful. And uh, and they now milk them as they do snakes, different venomous snakes. So yeah, it's very, very important work. But it's something that we don't do here in the UK, purely because we don't have the funnel web here, the Sydney funnel web. Um, and none of the others are actually that strong a venom like the Sydney funnel web. So, um, so there's no need. Um, and there's also an awful lot, um, as any of you guys that are, are interested in your venomous snakes, many of you will know um, that most venoms, especially um, anti-venoms, they have a shelf life. So they don't last particularly long before the proteins and what have you start breaking down within the anti-venom and that makes it useless. So, and it's also very expensive to um, produce as well. Now, um, when we used to work with venomous stuff many years ago, we used to keep them in the fridge and because um, they have to be kept at a reasonable temperature. And then what we used to find, I think, if I remember back then, about three months and they need to be swapped out. So every three months you're buying new antivenom. It's a very, very expensive, expensive thing. Even in zoos and things, they don't all carry every anti-venom. Cool. This is a good one, Dave. Gail, wanna one holler. Why do you have so many paintbrushes? Did you paint before you had your spiders? I do like a paintbrush. <laughs> now we, um, yeah, this is something that um, comes back to um, handling our spiders and and looking at it and seeing what we want to do one of the things that i try and get across in this hobby is nothing is black and white and many many hobbyists look in a black and white fashion so you need to fill in the gray areas in between now when we look at um what we're doing i like a paintbrush and i like a thin paintbrush like this and it's a funny thing because actually, when we were doing venomous snakes, I always liked a lightweight hook. I don't like heavy hooks. And I'm the same with these. I don't like heavy paintbrushes. So I always go for a nice light one like this because you don't need nothing big and cumbersome to move a spider. He's not that big and strong. We, you know, we're stronger than he is, so we can move him around. The other thing I like is as well, you've got two ends to it. We've got a pointy end, if you like, you know, blunt end. That is blunt, actually. Um, and we've got a brush end as well. So depending on what I want to achieve and how I want my spider to behave depends on what end you'll see me use. But I don't think the paintbrush idea come from you being this creative artist, no, did it? Where, no. where did the idea come from? Because I've never I'm, known you to be a painter, Dave. I'm not. Um, I did used to like art when I was a kid. I was never very good at painting. Um, no, I think... Um, I can't remember, to be honest. It is something that I've, I've always had around. And it is probably just something that I picked up one day and just thought, oh, you know what, I'll use that. And then I grew to grew to enjoy it and use it. And like I say, it's got two ends, which I really like. Um, because there's not just one way to move a spider. You'll see me sometimes when we do um, pairing spiders and things like that, sometimes I'll use the brush just purely to tickle a foot just to get it to move just that tiny tiny bit but i don't want it to run if i use the other end it's too hard it's too harsh so you might get a different response so yeah that's that's the reasoning behind a paintbrush it's a very valuable tool every spider keeper should have one <laughs> nugget 130884 what's the best way ways to remove an egg sac that all depends on the situation you're in and the spider that you're dealing with. Some spiders are very, very defensive and protective of their egg sacs. Others are like, yeah, fine, take it away, just get rid of it. You know, so it all depends. If you're, um, the best way to move them is to literally to uncover, as you would have seen in many of our videos, we literally, we uncover it, we'll pull back the bark, and then with a pair of tweezers, we'll just pop in, get hold of it, and we'll pull it out. That is the quickest way. In terms of the best way, it's the same as many things we do with a spider. The best way is whatever works the quickest and safest. 
because the last thing we want to do is spend all afternoon trying to get an egg sack. So the quickest and safest way is the best way, whatever that may be. Folk, oh, Hamamula. How far can an avic avic jump? Is it like a few inches or even a few feet? Yeah, they don't jump that far. Um, they tend to, it's almost like a hop. So they'll, they'll spring and they'll jump. If um, maybe, I think the furthest I've seen one jump is probably maybe a foot, if you're lucky, as a direct jump from one thing to another. Maybe a, maybe a foot, 12 inches. Um, people that say they can jump six feet is normally because they were up at the top of the room and they jumped and they went down and glided so far before they hit something. Um, that is not what we call a jump. A jump is where you physically go from A to B. If you're just jumping to avoid something and you jump into the abyss, then it could be whenever you meet the next thing that you land on. So, yeah, it's, um, but physically jumping, maybe a foot, six inches a foot. Cool. Liz McNeil, what is the point of moving a spider into an enclosure that has the same dimensions as the first one? That is a good question. That is a very, very good question. Um, and there's many answers to that. For me, myself, the main reason the main reasons I uh, move a spider is, as you'd have seen in some of our videos recently, we've had some new spiders come in that came in their enclosures. And I, I don't personally, may, I may not like the particular style of enclosure that they were in. And, and I'd rather the spider be in one of my own enclosures. So um, I'm quite OCD. I, you know, all my, I like all my enclosures to be exactly the same. Um, so that's one reason. Another reason is sometimes I may move it from one exo to another exo that is exactly the same, but I may move it because I want to change the spider's uh, psyche, if you like. I want to change how it feels. So sometimes I will do a rehouse purely because maybe we're looking at trying to get that spider to drop a sack and it's not happened yet. Sometimes a rehouse will often do that. Um, it may be that the enclosure that it's in at the moment doesn't lend itself primarily to a good breeding enclosure, so I may change it for that reason, to give our males a better chance. Um, there's many, many reasons why it can change. There's, there's nothing to say that once you house your spider, it needs to stay in there forever. You need to be able to move with the situation that's at hand, and that's the art of good keeping. You know, change with the flow, change with what's going on. You know, you might keep a spider and then one day decide, you know what, I want to breed this spider. And the enclosure that you got is perfectly inadequate for trying to breed a spider. So you need to up the game. You need to change it all and do things like that. So just be prepared. Don't, don't fall into the trap that it needs to stay the same. And you don't cause it any harm by moving a spider into a new enclosure. They make a new home really, really quick. And they're one of the things that are used to, even in the wild state, being disturbed and turfed out of their home and having to make a new one. So it's not a major, major issue to the spider. Black Tiger 67. Do you have issues with your spider's toes getting stuck in mesh lids? Seems all the US keepers are so very fearful of this. Talk about it often and therefore always, almost all cages are completely acrylic. Much love from Oregon. Right, this is, this is a subject that's been raging around the hobby for as long as I can honestly remember. And all I can say is that we need to look at it in a logical sense. I've been keeping now for 40 plus years and I have never had an issue where a spider has been damaged by a mesh top. Never. Now, that's not to say that it doesn't happen because there are people out there that have had issues. Now, 
why I say about keeping things in perspective is if we look at the amount of enclosures that are around the world and keepers around the world that have got mesh top enclosures and then look at the amount of spiders that have reportedly been damaged by the mesh enclosures, you will find it is very, very a minority, a very, very tiny amount. But what we do get, and we've seen many, many times, is on social media, someone will put out, um, they'll show an enclosure and it's got a mesh top. Someone will comment, you need to change that for plexiglass. Why? When you dig down, you find the person that actually made that comment has never had any personal experience of a spider being in trouble with a mesh top. What they have seen is many, many other posts put out by people that all say exactly the same thing, like sheep. They all comment that you should change it. It's dangerous. When we get down to the nitty gritty, hardly any of those people would have ever had first-hand experience. They are just regurgitating what they've read without any first-hand experience. And this is one of the things that's always caused problems within the hobby, is people telling things like it's happened to them, but they've never had that experience. And one of the things I always say to people, if you've not had the experience of something, you shouldn't really be commenting on it. Because it's, it's false comments. It's false knowledge. If you've not had that personal experience. Now for me, I've never had that personal experience. So I don't make any comments apart from the fact that I don't think there's a problem. I've never had a problem. And sometimes when you look at the, some of the things that have been actually um, shown to be correct, you know, the, the, someone's put something up and they show their enclosure, quite often or not, the enclosure wasn't designed in such a way that the spider was safe in the first place. It might be a fact that it's an arboreal enclosure with a terrestrial spider in there uh, and things like this. Sometimes it could be just the fact that, which I quite often think happens, is that there are male spiders that have matured and they're constantly on the move and they tend to be terrestrial males that have gone up and climbed. And they do climb and use their feet in a different way to an arboreal spider. Most of my spiders are arboreal. But that being said, even my terrestrial spiders, I've not had issues. So yeah, it's, um, I think a lot of it is false, false information. Okay, Dave. Like button. I have a thousand questions, but I'd really like to know if you've ever discovered one of your spiders in a place they shouldn't be like one on the loose or a baby that's managed to avoid the nursery pot and hit somewhere. Why? <laughs> Can I say I've not had this issue with spiders, but maybe snakes, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah we've, had, we've had the odd snake go on walk about. Um, Spider-wise, yeah, we don't tend to um, lose spiders. We have had slings um, on the loose, and that is purely where we've allowed them to hatch out in our exoterras. And... They come out through the front vents of the Exoterra. So if you gonna if you um, plan on keeping uh, or breeding your spiders in Exoterras, be aware that when they hatch, they're fine for the first few days, maybe a week. But when they choose the time to disperse, they disperse. They disperse on <laughs> mass, and they will leave that Exo overnight. <laughs> and we have on occasion where we for one reason or another we've been a bit behind and we haven't managed to get to the babies in time we've come in in the morning put the lights on and the ceiling is covered in slings and there might be 200 slings on the ceiling um we have had that happen on a few occasions um it's not something to worry about because once daylight comes, they all sit tight and they just wait. And we just go around with our pots and we just pick them all up again. So it's not really an issue. It's not, not a major problem. I guess if it was in your living room, it might be a little different. Um, and it also depends on your partners as well, husbands and wives, how they uh, deal with them. I'm lucky. Mine's very understanding. Um, but, yeah. It's all fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all a bit of fun. It is all fun, really, yeah. 
Yeah. I've never been put in danger to, as of to date, so no. I'm sure um, going forward it's not going to happen either. Yeah. Slings, won't, slings won't harm you. No. Okay, so we've got Laurie Milks. My boyfriend keeps his tanks pretty basic and bare, but I build mine more like displays with plants and such. Is either better for the spider as far as enrichment or am I just overthinking things? That's a good question. I don't think there's anything wrong with um, basic enclosures. Some of our enclosures are very, very basic. Um, in terms of how they look, that's more to do with how we feel about it. You know, sometimes it's nice to look at a really nice planted enclosure or whatever. Um, again, we build our enclosures depending on what we want to achieve from them. So if we want a pure breeding enclosure, it will be very limited because we're looking at um, not too much clutter because we want our males to have free access to be able to escape and things like that. Um, if we're looking at um, an enclosure that we want to have as a showpiece, then we will design it in a totally different way. So yeah, it all depends on, on what it is. But the actual spider itself, providing you cover all the parameters that keeps that spider happy, like food, water, temperature, humidity, then your spider really doesn't give a damn. It doesn't care. So it's more of a personal thing and what we want to achieve within the enclosures. So neither is wrong. They're both, they're both good. Cheryl Leeds has got a really cool question. How do spiders excrete? And can they adjust the tensile, tensile strength of their web? Ah, yes, the tensile strength of their web. Um, right, well, we'll cover the first one first. As you all know, um, for some reason or another, and I'll do it, I do actually, I understand the reason, is because of the way we decorate our enclosures, or the way I decorate mine anyway. I, I make everything looking as if it's coming to the front. So, I, so when I'm looking in, I'm looking at a picture. Now, quite often or not, that means that there's key points within that enclosure which I know the spider will rest on and sit on. Now, generally speaking, a spider will come out of its burrow, turn around so it's facing its burrow, and then poo in the opposite direction. <laughs> and some of them, or all of them actually, but your avix are very well known for it, they squirt poo at a real rate of knots, and they really fire it out. <laughs> and the first thing it hits is the front glass, which drives me crazy. I hate it. But you know they're okay. But yeah, we know they're okay. And it's sort of like, you know, if, if, you, if you've got poo flying everywhere, you know your spider's pretty good. As for the webbing, that's a really fascinating question. And yes, we've said many times before in our videos, the webbing is different depending on what the spider wants to achieve from it. So the webbing that they put across their enclosures when they're just resting for the day is different webbing to the webbing that they put out when they're molting or when they're sealing off a burrow for laying an egg sac. The webbing that they use for the egg sac is different to the webbing that they use that they live in. So yes, they make different webbing to depend on entirely on what they want to achieve from it. What its purpose is, is all different, very, very different. Next time you, you look at your spiders, look at the different webbing and the different things that they do and you'll start to see what I'm, what I'm talking about. There's, it's a fascinating thing, fascinating. I'm gonna stick with the toilet talk right now because Ames has said, if you see a new poo in your tarantula's enclosure, does this rule out constipation as a cause, cause of a really fat booty if the poo appears normal? And the second thing that I think is a hint around where this question really comes from is how long can a female wait to lay an egg sac? Right, the poo one and the constipation. <laughs> um, oh, such lovely subjects. The um, talk always comes up. Yeah. Um, what we're looking at with the um, with the constipation, you cannot tell through looking at a spider whether it's constipated or not. That's a little bit of a myth, um, but 
what we can do is we can look at the um, we can look at the enclosure and we can see whether our spider is doing what it should do naturally now if we're feeding our spider and the food is going but we're seeing no excrement anywhere then that could give us cause for concern um, and this is one of the reasons why I always clean my front glasses because it allows me I can walk in my room and I can look at any particular enclosure and know that that spider's fine because it would have pooed all over the front glass so it's giving me a story it's telling me that everything is fine in that enclosure one of the other things if you've got a spider that's constipated not only will you have a lack of poo on 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 your enclosure but you will also have a lack of appetite they will go off their food as well so this is another thing so you tend to add these things up to try and come to a solution at the end so yeah you can't actually physically tell by looking at them whether they're constipated or not um, and the second question what was that again the it's the egg sac dave how long oh, can the egg sac, a female yes. wait before she drops that right this is uh, another one that we often get asked now generally speaking depending on species of spider an egg sac can be laid anywhere from two weeks to over a year now the longer the time goes on the more chance we have of our female molting if she molts then she molts that sperm away with her and she is now infertile again so we'd need to pair her again and this is one of the worries with uh, with breeding our spiders and sometimes you will see the disappointment when I've looked into an enclosure and seen a molt where I'm really waiting for her to drop an egg sac, produce an egg sac, um, and she's molted instead. And sometimes you might have waited six, eight months to get to that stage. Now that's an awful lot of time and work that's now gone down the pan and we have to start all over again. So it can be rather frustrating. But um, the main things that make a difference are climatical changes. So things like temperature, humidity, and stuff like that. Um, and we're also looking in at the moment, something that we're playing with with breeding our spiders is the time in which we actually pair our spiders from the time they molted going forward. So it's sort of a common knowledge thing that you want to be pairing your spiders around about a month to six weeks after they molt. One of the things that I'm playing with at the moment is waiting until sometimes four or five months after they've molted before I pair them. And that is by looking at the shape of the abdomen. I'm looking for when that female is ovulating and producing eggs. And I think that if we can breed them at that point, we will get them to drop a sack much quicker because they are physically ready. They're there to do it. Um, but it's something that we're playing with at the moment. So there's, there's, there's an awful lot to still learn with breeding spiders, and we're still at the, the early stages, if you like. Are there any species that jump to mind that are notorious for uh, a long gestation period? So even if they're, they're eggs and you've had them fertilised, that even at that point they, there will be a, a, a long, long time before they... They all, they all vary. Um, an interesting one, actually, is one that we have at the moment, which is the wasp spider. That's a European spider. They're one that's um, starting to show up on British shores in the southern areas of the country. Um, and they're a really fascinating one. They're a true spider, but they produce an egg sac um, after mating in the summer. Then the females will die. They, they die off. And the egg sac will go all the way through the winter before it hatches the following spring. So that goes a long, long time. But as we said, it's climatical changes that make that egg sac do what it does. And it's very much the same for our uh, tarantulas and what have you within the hobby. But we just need to find what the key trigger points are. And we don't know them until we can breed a species time after time after time. And when we can do it like that, when we can do it regular we can now say that we've cracked that particular spider. Just because you breed a spider doesn't mean you've cracked it. We need to breed it regularly without fail before we can say we've we've cracked that spider. Holdu says, 
How are the spiders sticking to the glass? I've seen close-ups during some of your videos and it almost looks like there are two little claws on each of the legs and perhaps on some of the spiders are there suction cups. Right, The um, how they do this is you're correct in saying that they, there is two tiny little claws which are almost like retractable in the end of the toes and they use them to literally grip the finest um, imperfections on the surface of whatever they're on. Now glass is probably the, the, the slipperiest thing they're ever going to come in contact with and, um, and you'll see that they actually climb over that. What you will see in a lot of enclosures is they lay a very very fine layer of silk over the glass which you can hardly see but it's there and they actually use that and they climb on that as well. But you'll also see as well that they have very, very tiny hairs on the, on the soles of their feet, almost like a gecko's pads, and they can actually grip with those as well. So they will find the very finest of imperfections and they manage to grip in, and that, that's how they move around. But you'll also see with um, things like our funnel webs, they can't climb glass. And that's because their feet are done in a solely different way. They lack them really, really fine, tiny hooks as well. So they can't move in the same way. So not all spiders are built the same either. Cool. What's the most dangerous spider you have, chap? Is Ronaldo Di Camilli? The most dangerous spider. The most dangerous spider is the one that bites you. <laughs> That is the most dangerous spider. Um, in terms of um, venom, then um, any uh, piece of theory, your pokies, all got um, a, a strong venom. Uh, many of your baboons are strong, strong venom. Our funnel webs, they get a lot of theirs. They have a strong venom, but they're often mixed with the Sydney funnel web. So they're actual. The importance of them being really, really dangerous, I don't believe um, a Japanese funnel web is any more dangerous than, say, a piece of therial nata or maybe a feather leg baboon. You know, I think they're all very, very similar. The simple fact of the matter is there is very, very little um, pure information as to the, the true toxicity of many of these spiders. So we tend to lump them in a class of what we call as medically significant. And that basically means anyone, a, a full, strong, healthy adult will react differently to a child or an elderly, frail person. So it all depends an awful lot on your makeup. But a medically significant spider is a spider that's gonna practically upset your day. And depending on your physiology, yourself, it will depend on how much it upsets your day, if that makes sense. So would you class some of the hair kickers, the new worlds, um, against the old world with venom? Would you say there's medical significance? Most of most um, new world spiders are much less toxic than the old world spiders. Then they're not. They don't carry the same. Um, toxicity in their in their venom. They're not as strong. So with the hair kicking, with some of the really medical that is their first line of defence. And you wouldn't say that I would be in more concern with my breathing and anything like that from a hair kicker than I would with something that bit me and actually injected venom. No, cool. no, no. Hair kick, hair kicking is a defence mode, which is there to deter an attack. Biting is a last resort. Thank you, Dave. I've got a really good one from here. Most tarantulas I want to buy, I can only afford them as slings. I'm new to the hobby and I've been told slings are really fragile and can die very easy. So is it good or bad to feed them a couple of times a week to try and get them out of the sling stage faster? I've seen multiple views saying it's not good to feed them too much and is considered power feeding. I know people power feed snakes and that that's unhealthy, 
but snakes and spiders are two different species of animals. What do you what do you think? And that was sorry, right. ECAT three three O. Right, there's um again this is one of the things that we need to start to understand in the hobby is this black and white scenario. So when we look at slings, we tend to feed our slings more often than we do our older spiders. And this is purely because the metabolism of a sling is that much faster. So they are growing and they're growing quick. In terms of feeding them too much, we look at the actual spider as an individual and if if a spider if a sling if we look at it and its abdomen is huge compared to the rest of its body and it's shiny it's looking like it's at bursting point then yes you can say that you have been power feeding that sling and that is not a good idea that's not what we want to achieve what we're looking at is we want our sling to grow at a steady rate but we don't want it to be so slow that it's stumped its growth rate so we want to try and get it somewhere in the middle so we're looking at um getting regular malts and things like that but we're, we're looking at feeding um in a way that we can look at our sling and make sure that it doesn't get that big bulbous thing you, you often see on on facebook and that people will put pictures up of their their spiders and they've got huge great abdomens and they tend to get a little bit of a kick in on social media because of the, the state of that abdomen. It's too big. And it's a common, a common mistake for, for beginners to, f to feed too much. And one of the reasons is, is because it's exciting to see our spider catch its prey and, and eat. You know, it's a really exciting thing. But we need to step back from that and, and look at, you know, the welfare of our spider is paramount. So, yeah, you can feed too much, but... It's very easy to, to work it out. Is it more of a case that you'd overfeed juvies rather than your slings? No. No, you can't. You shouldn't overfeed anything at all. So it doesn't matter what it is. You shouldn't be overfeeding. Even when we're preparing our breeding females, we tend to put more food into them um, because we're looking at a different thing. So again, it's all about what the end product is, what we want to achieve by what actions we take. And this is what I say about it being black and white. It's not black and white. You you work your husbandry depending on what you want to achieve at the end. And it can be many different things. A hmm, little bit off, up, off subject here, but um, not really been asked something like this before. Is Liana, what do you think about having a patronage for your channel? Because she, she's someone that would very much be interested in giving you money for your channel what's your view right on it? we've we've been asked many many times um about a patronage for the channel and it is something that we've um we've looked into um and it's something that we we possibly will do in the future um one of the things you might well have noticed throughout the life of this channel is we don't like to do things half-heartedly so we want to um we want to do things properly. And also as well, I think it's one of the things that concerns me. If um, you, our subscribers, want to contribute into this channel, then I think that's a wonderful thing. It's an absolutely amazing thing. And, uh, and it is very much appreciated. But I also feel that you must get something for your contribution. So I'm, I, it doesn't sit well with me to um, say to people, here's the different, different grades of payment if I can't provide you something for that payment. Um, and just doing the normal channel like we do at the moment, I'm quite happy doing as we do, you know. And I don't feel that you need to pay for that or, or you know, donate or whatever. So it is something that we will do in the future. We are making steps at the moment um we're we've been mucking around for a long long time now about a website and also um doing some merch but again i've got very very firm ideas of how these things need to go about um 
and doing things like the merch i feel if you pay for something you should get top quality and value for money and that's what it's about and the the, the bottom line of this channel is to be um up front and as honest as we possibly can you know and we need to what you see is what you get sort of thing and um it's integrity is, is is of all importance we don't share anything on this channel unless we have done it ourselves and it is successful and it works you know we won't share anything unless them that criteria is met and that I think that doesn't include failures because that and can kind of come across. And that's that we very, don't fail, and that's but. very, very important. Yeah, we do share, we do share the failures. If something's gone wrong, it's important to share that as well. But that's where the transparency comes in. You know, that's where we are trying to be as honest as we possibly can, um, and we need to, we need to do that. And that ventures out into things like the patronage and things like that. When I can work out that I feel that you're getting something worthy of your donation, then we will do it, most definitely. It is something that will happen in the future, but we need to iron out a few bits and pieces and make it really worthwhile for you guys. You know, I want you guys to, to get the most out of it. Thanks, Dave. We've got, let's have a look. Ah, well, I think you kind of touched on this earlier, but you know how I deal with this. Chaos Theory. How do you clean the old enclosures? Is it soap and water, dishwater, or, right. oh, sorry, dishwasher, or just water with no detergent? Right. We have, um, if, it's, if it's an enclosure that's just recently been done or whatever, we, we just clean them out, soapy water, perfectly fine. If we need to do a deep clean, um, I have done a video in the past. Uh, and it is called, um, I think it's called uh, cleaning our enclosures or deep cleaning our enclosures, something along them lines. And um, and we actually use Viakill, which is what um, many, many housewives all over the country use to um, clean their ovens um, and surfaces and what have you. And it's a really strong, potent cleaner. And I hear, when we put the video out, I had people jumping up and down crazy you'll kill your spiders you know this stuff is violent stuff and yes it is and that's why we use it because it's absolutely it, it obliterates everything it will take lime scale off it will do everything but the most important thing is whatever you use to clean your enclosures doesn't matter what you use just make sure that you thoroughly wash it out flush it out and make sure that it is perfectly free of anything that you, any chemical that you use to clean it. There is no harm in anything that you use. Just make sure you clean it fresh at the end of it. Totally flush it out. And in some cases, um, put it outside and let it air for a couple of days. You know, it's not going to harm it. But just make sure that you thoroughly, thoroughly flush it through. And you'll be fine. I suppose for you, Dave, with the way you keep your enclosures, it's not allowing it to get to such a point where it needs well, no. such a deep clean. Yeah, I mean, if you if you spot clean and clean your glasses anyway, there's no need. The only time we clean an enclosure here is if we actually empty it, and then we fully deep clean it, and uh, we go from there. Or if we're buying second-hand enclosures, it doesn't matter how clean they look, we will generally deep clean them because we want to know. It's clean from the moment we have it. So, yeah, that's, that's a good point, actually. Yeah. Destination Disney. On the, last, on the last spider, since you can't see it, I take it's about this video, sorry, David, with the, the handling there. You couldn't see it and you had to dig it up. What would have happened if it was molting when you dug it up? Have you ever had something like this happen? Cool. Yes, I know. Yeah, you're talking about the um, the king baboon. Um, I, I think. Yes, I think it was Dave. Yep. No, it wasn't. No. It was the one you said you hadn't. We hadn't it, seen. Yes. Yes. Uh, it was the Javan Fury. And it was the one. It ended up with the the leg fused underneath. If you remember. 
I think you were right with the king baboon. Uh, if it was the video where we done the king baboon and the leg was caught up underneath, um, I think what you're talking about though is the Jarvan Fury, which we done in the rehouse video, where we done the seven spiders, and it was the last spider that we done. So I think that's the one you're talking about. But yes, both fossorial spiders. So the the issue is exactly the same. Um, yes. If you dig down, and this, this is always a thing, if we're rehousing fossorial spiders, because we don't see them all the time, um, it, it can be an issue. But we can also go back to the fact that if we've not seen our spider for a long, long time, then we can look at a couple of different things. One, we can look at, is there food moving around in there? If there is food moving around in there and it has been for some time, that points to the fact that we may have a dead spider in there. If the entrance to the burrow is sealed off, but sealed off heavily, then we can pretty much assume that it's actually molting. So then in that case, what we would do is we would save our rehouse until the spider opened that um, entrance up again or we saw it. Um, if we go through, and it might have gone through, depending on the spider, this is a real difficult one, but if the spider has sealed itself in and we haven't seen it for maybe a couple of months, then we might be tempted to dig down and have a look. If we're just going to rehouse it anyway, if we dig down and we find that our spider is actually in the process of molting, then we would just leave it be. So we would uncover it to the point where we would actually recognize that it's it's molting. Once we found it in that position, we would just completely leave it be, leave it nice and peaceful, put the lid back on, don't cover it up. You've already uncovered it. So don't, whatever you do, don't cover it up. Just leave it as you found it, yeah? Chances are it's on its back and it's in the process. Now, we would just literally put the lid back on, put it somewhere quiet for 24 hours. When you go back in 24 hours, chances are that spider would have molted out and it would be fine. Now, depending on age, if it's an old spider, we may leave it in there for another week. Just leave it somewhere quiet and let it harden up. If it's a young spider, another day or two, it will harden up and it will be on the move. Once it's hardened up, the chances are it will try and burrow into whatever is remaining in what substrate you've got remaining inside that enclosure, which then tells you it's ready, you can move it again. So you just dig it up again and move it. But yeah, if you do find one that's in, in the process of molting, just leave it be, let it get on with the job. The only reason it's dangerous to, um, it's, it's not dangerous to up to disturb a spider when it's molting. The reason it's dangerous for a molting spider to be disturbed is if it's in the wild state, then it can't defend itself. And a predator will come along, it may eat it, kill it, do whatever, but it cannot protect itself. In this, in um, the captive state, there is them, not them dangers. So you can, you know, go in, have a look, do things. It's not gonna make any difference to the spider. It will just get on with it and carry on doing what it's doing naturally. It's really all about, it's, it's more dangerous when they're in the wild. People get them confused. The wild and the captive state, two very, very different things. Okay, Rianne Duffy, my question is, how do you go about heating your beastie rooms? Right, we use um, oil-filled radiators that are run on built-in thermostats. And I found this to be the most economical way. And also it gives me the best heat. So I... I I uh, heat my room rather than heat individual enclosures. I personally don't like heating individual enclosures. Uh, if you haven't got a room like I've got, I'm very lucky, I've, I've got a room that I can do. If you haven't got a designated room and you've only got a few spiders, then I would suggest you invest in um, a large reptile vivarium, like a four-foot reptile vivarium, Put a heat mat in that on the back wall and run it on a pulse thermostat. Always important to use a pulse thermostat because you will get a better heat. Um, if you use a mat stat, that flicks on and off. 
So your, your heat builds up, turns off, goes cold, comes on, builds up, turns off. A pulse thermostat will trickle it in. So you maintain a very good temperature. Um, if you want something bigger, you need something even more room, then maybe a converted wardrobe or something like that. But you're looking at making a space that you can heat inside and, that, and you can keep your spiders within it in their enclosures. And that is the best way of heating them. Uh, heat cables can be used um, to some extent. Um, heat mats, you just need to be careful. Don't put them underneath your enclosures. Many, many spiders are killed that way. So um, they can't escape the heat. So it's uh, very important that your spider can get away. However you heat your enclosure, it's important that your spider can get away from direct heat. So yeah, but I, I heat my room and I've found this to be the best way. Well, that follows on nicely. I'm gonna, this will be the kind of last wrap up, shall we say. Cool. But there's a few questions that are all related around this same area. So I'm just gonna read those out. So Shaney Sean, how many years would you say you have owned tarantulas? Luke Nadu, when did you actually begin to keep teas and other invertebrates? Was it before the creation of the British Tarantula Society in the early mid 80s or after? He's just curious. He's trying to get your age out of you, Dave. <laughs> Tags, Tags Vater, Patrick, why or how did you get into beasties? Brian Cuprison, can you give us a short history of your experience and progression within the tarantula hobby? Judith Hobson, what's happening with the overflow room? Is it as nicely organised as the beastie room? So someone's heard about the overflow day. Ruby Lynn, how and why did you become Beastie Dave? Can we ever meet camera lady? And Dragonfly Arts One, are you planning for a bigger beastie room? Wow, there's so many questions there. I've forgotten where we started. Well, I think the, um, the, the some of them a little bit of some of them we've answered already. Um, yeah, I, I've been in the hobby for in with spiders and things maybe forty years. Um, as with the actual Tarantula Society and, and the shows, I can remember going to shows when when I was a nipper. Um, I say a nipper, I would have been in my late teens. So back in the early, early 80s. Um, and we used to travel. And that was because of, uh, I was back in the zoo world then. And um, colleagues in the zoo world would go to the shows. And then there'd be a big fight amongst us all as who could get the day off. And it was always a big thing. If you managed to get the day off and go to the show. I was lucky if I actually got to go to one maybe two shows in a year purely because of work so um it was difficult difficult to get there but the shows were like um they were like candy stores but they were very very different back then to what they are now um we didn't have the variety that we have now so it was very very different back then but just as exciting and the younger you are the more exciting in some respects because there's just a whole brave new world out there um what else was there? In terms of um, what got me started, I think it was just a natural progression. And um, I think it's, I've always, always been involved. My my parents were involved as well. So they they had a keen hobbyist sort of thing. They never done it as a, as a job, but they, they were hobbyists. And, um, and it started off with reptiles. So, my initial thing came from reptiles but as i said earlier on my um i've been lucky to have been exposed to to many many exotics from a very young age and um and basically just went from that so um yeah i think that sort of like does that what was the other questions i think how little beasties was born ah the uh, yeah the channel was um was built really because of lockdown and um you had a lot of uh, I, friends on facebook didn't yeah you? we had um we used to um i used to put little videos little clips of some of my spiders up on on facebook and, and lots of people used to say to me oh you should do a youtube channel and uh 
I was always like, no, oh, I can't, I can't, now, I can't imagine like anybody it. wanting to watch that kind of thing. And, um, and then lockdown came and, um, I was basically told by camera lady that either find something to do or get out of the house. So, you so I didn't think you'd admit to that. So we, um, <laughs> I thought, you know what, I'm going to have a go at this YouTube lark. And, uh, I never ever dreamt that it would be as it is today. And to be fair, my hobby has changed accordingly because of YouTube, because of you guys. So before, I used to keep things and do things for my own interest. Now I sometimes look at things and do things for your interest. So, you know, I look at different breeding projects that maybe I wouldn't have looked at before. And, um, and, and it gives me another challenge, it gives me something to do. Um, and yeah, and also sometimes, you know, you guys suggest things and it, it, it makes me think about things in a different way. So I then go ahead and do them things as well. So yeah, it's all, it's all come about purely because of that. But the success of the channel is purely down to you lot. You know, you have made this channel what it is today and keep us driving along. You know, we get an awful lot of fun and enjoyment out of this. And, um, it's something that we really, really enjoy. And the shows, as we were saying earlier on about the first shows when I was young, it was all exciting. Now the shows have changed entirely. And because of the channel, I meet so many of you guys at the shows and it really, really makes my day. You know, it's, it gives me a buzz like you wouldn't believe. So, um, yeah, it's really, really exciting times. And, um, it's, it's proven to be a, a phenomenal journey and one that we enjoy every day. We're doing it all the time. Kind of follows up with wrapping it up with like where where's Beasties going, Dave? Are we are we looking at another Beastie room? Or oh, right, the second the future. The second Beastie room is because we outgrew this Beastie room. So we are lucky enough at the moment where we live that um, we have now moved into Camera Lady's office and. Um, We've sort of like dominated one of the walls in there and uh, we've racked it out the same as we got in the, in the beastie room here. Um, many of what we keep in, in that particular room is, is kept in different ways because of different reasons. So we tend to keep all of our mature males in there because we keep it a little bit cooler. Um, if we're growing stuff on that we want to produce slowly, then we keep it in there. Um, so things like that. Um, we don't have as many um, bioactive enclosures in that room as we have in this room. Um, but it depends on what we're doing. So that room is more of a work room um, where we, we, we're working to an end for something. It has a purpose. Um, excuse me. This room is more of an enjoyment and we like enclosures that we like to look at and things like that so more showcasing environment if you like um so yes yeah, it's, it's i'll say beastie room two is definitely more practical yes it's, it's more of a practical still, room organized and his yeah. ocd follows through to all yes yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> I, I still I, yeah i still don't like lots of different enclosures and things <laughs> so yeah everything it is pretty much a mirror image of, of what it is in here to be fair um but it's just used in a different way but yeah, I think that's uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So is that all of our questions for today? Think, yeah, yeah. We've really we've really right, delved we into all of that. We've we've covered what appears to be many many questions, and I dread to think how long this video has gone on for. Um, it's gone on longer than I anticipated. I must admit. Now, um, one of the things I think is uh, we will in the future we we will do a live. And have a little bit of a play with that. We've never done a live video before. Um, and it's something I think that could be quite interesting. We might do one evening. We just need to try and arrange some time that we can free up, that we can do that. Uh, and the, I guess the main thing to do is to say thank you to all of you guys for supporting our channel. Um, without you, we wouldn't be here. And we've, we've reached a, a massive, massive audience. You know, all over the world, you know, we, we touch people in so many different countries 
and it's really fascinating to hear your responses. It's lovely reading your comments on all of the videos that we put out. It's really what keeps us going, keeps us driving along, and gives us an idea of what you guys want. Um, if you can always, you know, whenever you watch a video, hit that like button, get your notifications as well, you know, and make your comments. It's, it's what drives the channel. And if we can um, show YouTube how much you're enjoying the content and what have you, it then in turn gives us the, the right cues for the algorithm to pick up and spread us even further out there and we can hit more and more people. And uh, yeah, it just helps grow the channel. You know, it's, you guys have put us where we are today. So it's a fantastic thing. What's and super touching, Dave, as well. It's um, people even outside the hobbyists, like some of the messages that they yes. get. Were there like Snook TV? It's just yeah. a little bit of feel. I it's think not um, even people necessarily in the hobby. Yeah, I think it's 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 amazing the amount of people, the amount of you guys that have never kept a spider, but you love watching the videos. You know that, that makes my day. That 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 really really, I like that. That gives us a warm feeling. My Snook and, TV um, is Columbo, so I'm I'm really proud that someone Snook the, TV is you. It's like <laughs> I know what that's I, about. <laughs> And I think it's also great that we have so many arachnophobes, uh, people that are terrified of spiders, that actually sit back and watch. And they've seen spiders in a different light. And that's what we try and show. That's what we're trying to share. That these things aren't big, scary things, things of nightmares and stuff like that. You know, And it's so, so nice to hear people that were physically terrified to the point where they would be physically sick. They would throw up through fear are now watching spiders and seeing them for the beautiful things that they really are. And that that that's is what makes it worthwhile for us here in the Beastie Room. And that's what it does. It's amazing. So, all right. I'd just like to thank you all once again for supporting our channel. And I hope you enjoyed this video. And we will try and look at doing a few things like this in the future. But for now, we need to go and get a cup of tea. I'm starting to get a bit hoarse. So uh, don't forget, be calm, be gentle, and love your spiders. And I will see you soon, guys.